with Mobile One and Champion Spark Plugs. Ayrton Senna assumes a commanding lead in the World Drivers' Championship after winning for the fifth time at the Belgian Grand Prix. Williams, meanwhile, have a weekend they'd rather forget. Jordan go through the upheaval of losing one driver, only to introduce an immense new talent who makes immediate impact on his Grand Prix debut. All those stories, plus a look at the career of Belgium's top driver Thierry Boutsen, and Honda's new entry in the power stakes game. All coming up on the official story of the FIA Formula One World Championship, Inside Track. This is Brussels, capital of Belgium and the headquarters of the European community. The Belgians, of course, noted in the world of diplomacy and for their savoir faire, playing hosts to the world. The nation's capital is one of the many areas where, with careful ease, the Belgians entertain not only themselves, but also the world community. Belgium's a country with great sporting traditions, particularly in football and in cycling. But the annual event which attracts the greatest attention of all is the Belgian Grand Prix. spa franc champs a circuit 90 minutes drive from Brussels, set in the heart of the Ardennes Forest. It's one of the classic all-time circuits, a favourite of the top drivers. Oh, I like the circuit. I, I like to drive around here. I enjoy it very much. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it's one of the, one of the great circuits of the world because it's a driver circuit. But on the other hand, I think, uh, despite that, you need a good car equipment to do well, otherwise you can't do it. It's got some <clears throat> fantastic challenging corners, you've got to be a little bit brave and um, very, very precise, it's very high speed. And also you have to consider that this is a critical time of the championship, is where you really just make it or you don't. The defending world champion Ayrton Senna's record at Spa four wins in the last six years. Nigel Mansell knew he had to end that streak if he was to keep within striking distance of the World Drivers' Championship. The standings. Heading into this race, Senna with a 12-point lead over Mansell. Certainly not an insurmountable margin, but with just six races in the Formula One calendar left, every point would be crucial. Power, reliability, tyre selection, all important factors at Spa, one of the most demanding circuits in Formula One. Jean Alesi takes us through a lap of the track in his Ferrari. So the chicane is just the part before the, the pit lane. It's one of the easier parts of the circuit. Uh, for the hairpin in the second gear, it's uh, very, very slow to, uh, to, to take this uh, part. After it's very difficult because you have to, uh, to go to, to the sixth gear uh, as a corner uh, called uh, Low Rouge. It's very, very difficult because quick and it's downhill and uh, uphill. And uh, just after this part, uh, you go to seventh gear. The speed is very high, it's 320 kilometers for the very late uh, braking zone for a corner in fourth gear. This bar is very technical. You go all in fourth and after fifth, and you go for the corner right in third gear. Very long. You have to wait a little bit to use the power. Fourth for this uh, left corner. Now it's uh, downhill, fifth, sixth. Very quick corner and uh, very, very long. One of the longest 
uh, of all, all the circuit. You stay in six, again fourth for another technical uh, part. You you go to third, third, fourth, fifth, and you you come back for to the to the box six seven. This part is very very difficult because it's a little bit bumpy and you never never you have to touch the, the curve otherwise you uh, you lose a lot of time. Go through the chicane three fourths and fifths. The finish line here. Yeah. Initially, the focus of the Grand Prix weekend was on the Jordan team, following the unfortunate news that Bertrand Gachot's career as a Formula One driver was now in serious doubt. He'd been jailed for 18 months for assaulting a London taxi driver with tear gas. I suppose, in one way, we were incredibly disappointed, but, you know, the severity of the sentence seems to be very harsh too, but I'm not a lawyer, so it's very difficult for me to say. But um, the team, and still are, devastated. We are very upset, particularly Bertram, his home race here at Spa, um, and the fact that he's not here because he was, if you like, one of the founder members of the project. He came and decided to commit himself to the team when the idea of the Jordan Grand Prix car was really a dream at the time. Gasho's replacement was named as Michael Schumacher, a 22-year-old German who arrived at Jordan from the Mercedes team in the World Sports Car Championship. After the news of Bertram not being released, we gave him a run at Silverstone last week, 30 laps, uh, and in, during that occasion he, he did a really good job. A big risk for Jordan to take. Schumacher had never driven at Spa before, a Formula One debut in trying circumstances. Nevertheless, Schumacher felt that his experience in sports cars with Mercedes had groomed him perfectly for the task in hand. I think it was quite important for me because I get so many chances to do so many kilometres so many testing and I work with a quite big team together and I think that's really well for me you know I have many I, I get many experience there and that's one of the points I could why I could be so much in the front now Gachot's sentence caused a few roar in Belgium the 18-month jail term being generally regarded as too severe it wasn't long before signs of protest started to show Gachot's friend sports car driver Harold Heisman explains uh, it was a spontaneous uh, demonstration, just close friends of Burton at uh, a demonstration last week in uh, Brussels in front, of, in front of the English Embassy. And uh, they're planning a big demonstration, it appears that they're planning a big demonstration for the 10th of September uh, in front of the EEC and they expect several thousand of people. Uh, just people have gone mad here in Belgium about all this thing and uh, they think it's very unfair and loads of people want to show their support to Burton. So it's good for Burton. While Jordan sorted out driver problems, McLaren Honda were busy trying to perfect a new system which would give them a decided advantage in the power stakes. Variable trumpets on the inlets of the engine. The engine management computer measures the air intake into the engine. And depending on the car's location on the circuit, the trumpets either go up or down, maximizing the torque curve whether coming out of a corner, in the middle of a straight, or at the end of a straight. It's a development that certainly caught the eye of everyone at Williams. Now we have obviously got fixed trumpets. Um, we don't know whether it's the right or wrong way to go, but what I'm saying is, is that they have moved the, uh, the stakes a lot higher, and um, it's going to be tough for us this weekend too. And still to come on Inside Track, a review of the last decade of Grand Prix in Belgium, We'll talk to Thierry Bootsen about his Formula One career and show you the highlights of Friday and Saturday qualifying as we follow the battle for pole position. It's all coming up here on Screensport.
Part of the present Spa-Frank or Sean circuit is Public Road, a reminder of the origins of this race when the track stretched for miles and the lack of safety features made it especially treacherous. All the great names of the past appeared here, Brabham, Hill, Fittipaldi and Stewart to name just a few. Interestingly, the sons of those drivers continue to uphold the family name in motor racing in the Formula 3000 support here, race to be held here at Spa. There. Don't touch that. That's yeah. that's Wilson Fittipaldi and Jackie Stewart have helped you guide the, the careers of sons Christian and Paul. Oh, yes. you you give them David Brabham and Damon Hill also have impeccable pedigrees. But Jackie Stewart, seeing his son race at Spa for the first time, was to evoke memories of his early days on the old circuit. Well, if there are circuits that are going to call, be called the circuit of men, then Spa-Francorchamps would be one of those, because in the old days, when it was a much longer circuit, eight miles long, uh, it really had a remarkable ability to catch people out in the most dangerous fashion. There was little or no uh, safety precautions at all. There were no barriers, there were trees, there were barbed wire fences to keep the cows in the field. There were unprotected farmhouses, telegraph poles. It really was a treacherous track. Uh, of course, it was a challenge. And to do well in Spa and to be in pole position or the front row of the grid really you felt you had achieved something and you felt that you had arrived in Formula One. The Belgian Grand Prix has always been a significant stop on the Grand Prix calendar. In 1981 it was held at Zolder. Carlos Reutemann was on pole in the Williams but Ricardo betrays in the arrows stalled on the grid. Mechanic Dave Luckett bravely went out onto the track to start the car. Behind him the unsighted Siegfried Storr in the other arrows hit Luckett. Earlier that weekend, another mechanic had been killed in the pit lane, but as horrific as this incident appeared, Luckett survived with multiple fractures of his legs. Ten years later, he's still in motor racing, as chief mechanic with Leighton House. The race was restarted, minus the two arrows of Patrasian store. The new start would be for the original distance of 70 laps. Nelson Piquet, Alan Jones and Carlos Reutemann would stage a season-long battle for the Drivers' Championship that year, but on this day, Piquet went off. As did Alan Jones, the Australian setting quickest lap before losing control and going into the arm code. Carlos Reutemann went on to win with Jacques Lafitte in the Ligier second and Nigel Mansell in the Lotus third, the very first podium finish of his career. In 1982, again at Zolder, a dark cloud of gloom hung over the starting grid, two missing Ferraris signifying the loss of one of motor racing's legends. In Friday practice, Gilles Villeneuve had clipped the back of Joachim Mass's march. Villeneuve's Ferrari went airborne and he was thrown from the car into the catch fencing. He died later that night. Ferrari pulled their other car out of the race as a mark of respect for Villeneuve. In the race, John Watson was chasing Keke Rosberg on the last lap when the Finn lost it, allowing Watson through to pass him into first place. Watson was the winner, Rosberg second and Nicky Lauda third. But Lauda would be disqualified for having raced in an underweight car. That meant Eddie Cheever in the Ligier was awarded third place. In 1983, the venue was switched to Spa-Francorchamps for the first time in 13 years. On pole position, Alain Prost in the Renault. But it was Andrea de Cesaris who had an absolutely brilliant start, weaving through Patrick Tombe and Prost to take the initial lead. However, de Cesaris would later succumb to mechanical problems and Alain Prost would take his seventh career win. Tombe was second, Eddie Cheever in the other Renault third. Unfortunately for Prost though, he would miss out on the World Championship that year by only two points to Nelson Piquet. In 1984 it was back to Zolder and the two Ferraris of Alvaretto and Arnoux were on the front row. Keke Rosberg in the Williams faltered and barely got away. The former 1982 World Champion had to work his way from the back of the grid and he did a magnificent drive which eventually earned him a fourth place finish. Michele Alboreto was holding a comfortable lead until he went off the track here. His 
car undamaged and he carried on without losing his lead and the Ferrari driver went on to win. Derek Warwick in the Renault finished second with Alvaretto's teammate René Arnoux third. The Belgian Grand Prix was moved back to Spa for 1985 where a new and more durable surface had been laid down. Ayrton Senna was just behind Alain Prost on the front row but had a superb start to jump into the lead. Nelson Piquet got into second place but then spun, holding up the rest of the field and allowing Senna to build on his lead. Unlike the previous year, 1985 wasn't exactly a vintage Belgian Grand Prix for Ferrari as we see in this pit stop of Stefan Johansson. The slippery surface made it difficult as the cars went from rain tyres to slicks when the track began to dry. But Senna managed to hold on to win, and needless to say, the entire Lotus team were quite pleased by the result. Nigel Mansell finished second that year, with Alain Prost third. In 1986, the list of starters in Belgium would be minus one name, Elio De Angelis. He had been killed in testing at the Paul Ricard circuit in France just one week earlier, so there would be just 25 cars on the grid. Nelson Piquet was on pole position, Gerhard Berger in the Benetton was beside him and going into the first corner, Prost decided to take the inside, Senna the outside. Berger squeezed Prost, causing a chain reaction at the La Source hairpin. Piquet and Senna got away cleanly, with Nigel Mansell in third place. But unfortunately for Piquet, he would later retire with mechanical problems, leaving his teammate Mansell to battle it out with Senna for the lead. In the end, Mansell overtook Senna to score his first win of 1986, a win he dedicated to the memory of his former teammate, Elio De Angelis. In 1987, Mansell was on pole position and Ayrton Senna followed him through to take Nelson Piquet for second place. But the race would have to be restarted following a serious accident on the first lap. The two Tyrrells of Philippe Streff and Jonathan Palmer had collided, sending debris all over the track which then had to be cleared up. On the restart, Ayrton Senna weaved his way around Mansell to go into first place. At a controversial moment later in the race, Mansell pulls alongside Senna, the two of them go into the corner side by side, they touch and both cars slide off the track and out of the race. Alain Prost would go on to win with his McLaren teammate Stefan Johansson finishing second. For Prost, the win marked his 27th career victory tying him at that stage with Jackie Stewart for the most career victories. Andrea De Cesaris' Brabham ran out of fuel on the last lap and the Italian pushed his car to a third place finish. In 1988, Alan Prost had a superb start to take the lead from teammate Ayrton Senna. But on the same lap, Senna retook the lead heading into Le Combe. Ivan Capelli in the March and Riccardo Patrese in the Williams stage, a tremendous battle, won eventually by Capelli in a thrilling overtaking manoeuvre. Senna eventually won the race with Frost second and Thierry Boutsen third. However, Boutsen and his teammate Alessandro Nannini were disqualified for using an irregular fuel, so third place was given to a very deserving Ivan Capelli, moving up from fourth place. The following year, low cloud and a strong sweeping rain caused the start of the race to be delayed by 90 minutes. The rain created rivers carrying mud across the track and marshals were kept busy trying to clean the surface. Ayrton Senna ran a superb race in keeping just ahead of Alain Prost and Nigel Mansell as both were just behind the leader right until the chequered flag. Last year was a story of starts, three to be exact, the original start would see Nigel Mansell's Ferrari pushed into the barrier heading into La Source and then Martin Donnelly running into the back of teammate Derek Warwick. Mansell's car couldn't be moved so the race had to be restarted. The cars got off smoothly for the second start even though it's extremely tight as we see from the onboard camera of Alessandro Nanini's Benetton. However, Paolo Barilla had a major accident in his Minardi, scattering wreckage across the track and causing the race to be stopped for a second time. The race got underway for good on the third try, with Senna leading from Berger and Prost. But Prost then took Berger for second place, as we saw from the camera on Thierry Poutsen's Williams. Ayrton Senna would go on to win his fourth Belgian Grand Prix, but the Brazilian Spa always a favourite. Looking back, 88, 89, and 90, exactly this time I was, on the, I was able to 
just find that little extra which gave us the edge over everybody else on the following races in the championship and uh, I hope we can repeat the same dose this year certainly Senna along with Nigel Mansell and Ricardo Petrosi was heavily back to win here in 1991 but the sentimental choice among the locals at least was Thierry Bootsen he showed great potential early in his career in Formula 3 and Formula 2 then secured enough financial backing to land a seat with the Arrows Formula 1 team in 1983 appropriately his first Grand Prix was at Spa in his native Belgium that same year Although Bootsen failed to score a point in his debut season, the Arrows team principal, Jackie Oliver, liked what he'd seen. Within the first practice session, we saw that we had uh, a future great driver on our hands, not just for the speed, but the way in which he related the information about the car. I remember one thing, how then at that time we had three or four different types of tyre, and he would uh, be able to judge the merits of each tyre. So not only was he new to the, to the car and the team, uh, he was able to be able to judge what was the best tyre to use. I remember being quite impressed by that. Arrows retained boots and services for 1984 and at the Belgian Grand Prix introduced their BMW turbo engine. He scored the first points of his career that year, sixth in Brazil, then fifth at San Marino. A total of only five points scored but Bootsen was exhibiting the polished professionalism that would earn him so much respect in the Formula One world. After four seasons with Arrows, Bootsen joined the Benetton Ford team for 1987. He'd already proved to be a steady, reliable performer with Arrows. Now he took his chance to prove that he was quick as well. He claimed six third place finishes, was fourth in the Drivers' Championship by the end of 1988 and had come into his own in Grand Prix racing. Then in 1989, Bootsen was employed by Williams as their number one driver, and the amiable Belgian grabbed the chance to secure his first victory of his career. It came in the Canadian Grand Prix 1989, in pouring rain despite having this spin. He was able to hold off all the challenges and take the chequered flag. That same year, at the last race of the season in Australia, it threw it down again, making it tough going even for the world champion. But through it all came Bootsen, overcoming the adverse conditions to win his second race of the season and finish fifth in the Drivers' Championship with 37 points. Last season, 1990, disappointing for Bootsen, he won only one race, the Hungarian Grand Prix in August, and with Frank Williams opting to re-sign Nigel Mansell for the 1991 season, Bootsen was out in the cold. Well, the personal relationship was something that was missing a lot at Williams I mean they that was affecting me more than anything else I mean if you want to do a job you do it hundred percent more than that I mean you think about it and you work all the time but uh, your car and if the people are not uh, respecting you in the team I mean there's no point in continuing like that so I thought uh, that I wanted to change air especially after Hungary when I finished the race I won the race went to the restroom did all the press interviews and all that came back to the motorhome and everybody had left so I couldn't even make drink a glass of champagne with anybody or anything like that I mean it was very very disappointing and that's when I decided I didn't want to live that kind of experience anymore it was uh, not nice at all so Bootsen left Williams and along with designer Frank Durney helped put the pieces together for Guy Ligier's team that's been starved of success for so long it hasn't been a vintage year, but the arrival of technical director Gerard Ducarouge and the clinching of the deal for Renault engines in 1992 means that at last there's real optimism in the team. And if we can get everything well organized for next year, for sure we'll have a good car. We'll have one of the best engines available. I think we'll be in good, good shape. Eight drivers looking for a lift from pre-qualifying into official practice, but only four will get through. And the fastest of them is Martin Brundle in the ever-improving Brabham Yamaha V12, head and shoulders above the rest. Teammate Mark Blundell took second fastest time despite this spin to further reinforce the Brabham Yamaha's improved progress. 
Frenchman Olivier Guillard, by comparison, lacked horsepower in the V8 Ford engine Fond Metal, but still took third in pre-qualifying. Alex Caffey in the footwork took the final pre-qualifying place, but sadly, Alboreto's hopes were deflated as team boss Jackie Oliver cringed. Well, it's purgatory for us at the moment. Uh, to change engines mid-season uh, with a car that's not designed for it and all the difficulties we have, I mean, it's uh, uh, pathetic would probably be a good word. A trying time for footwork, but an even bigger test for the AGS Ford of Gabriele Tarquini as he fought for grip and a way through to official practice on the spectacularly fast Blanchiment. Crashing the low-budget team's car badly, fortunately with no broken bones. But uh, I, I don't have the fracture. I don't have... Uh, it's okay. All, all it's okay. Now I have uh, all the, the confusion in the head, but... Uh, it's normal for me. In official qualifying, Belgian Eric van der Poel crashed heavily at the same daunting bend, and practice had to be stopped while the wrecked Lamborghini was removed. The stunned Belgian ended up in hospital for a precautionary brain scan, but fortunately he was fine. When practice restarted, most drivers were anxious to rejoin the track, but unfortunately for Alain Prost, they all seemed to want to be out there at the same time. They could still get in the way, and they kept Alain Prost, the number one Ferrari driver, down in fourth place. Nigel Mansell was third, saying that McLaren had raised the power stakes. As Gerhard Berger proved, second with renewed Honda power. While Senna took provisional pole, the McLaren duo being the only drivers inside the 1 minute 50 bracket, the Brazilian also set a new qualifying lap record during what seemed a very busy session. Well, it was a bit frenetic session because with the accident halfway through it meant lots of people were held up in the pits and then everybody was going out at the same time and it strategically was very important to be out there among us the first cars. But the sensation of Friday qualifying was 22-year-old German rising star Michael Schumacher. The former German Formula 3 champ and Mercedes-Benz junior team member was totally committed and yet confident as he flung the Jordan Ford around a track he'd never driven on before. Five places ahead of teammate Andrea De Cesaris, the Jordan Grand Prix team were delighted not only by his first official showing, but also by his approach and communication skill, so vital in setting up a Formula 1 car. We spoke to him after practice. You must be very happy with your results. Yeah, sure, I'm really happy. But uh, anyway, I have to say, with this car, you can do this qualifying time, you know, uh, the car feels really good and uh, <laughs> it makes a lot of fun to drive and also for the time, I'm really happy, yeah. Which brought us to final qualifying at this historic track in the Belgian Ardennes and whilst most were impressed with Schumacher's performance, none could forget that he had replaced poor Belgian Bertrand Gacho, who was languishing in a London jail, missing his home Grand Prix patriotic messages of support found sympathy from all quarters. But Schumacher showed he wasn't a one-hit wonder by initially climbing to a stunning fifth overall in the very competitive Jordan Ford. Ayrton Senna remained fastest from Friday in the McLaren. But then the diligent Alain Prost proved his spa calculations were correct by stealing the pole from his new friend Senna but this was to be one of Prost's shortest held pole positions of his career. Within 30 seconds, Ayrton Senna simply pulverized the Frenchman's time. His McLaren Honda, with its new, more powerful engine, was already out on the track, setting a super quick time, and as the red and white projectile hurtled across the line, Senna had shaved one and a half seconds off his Friday time. Further demotion awaited Alain Prost as Nigel Mansell made his second qualifying run to take the front row placing from the Ferrari driver. Prost was disappointed to be bumped by Mansell. Gerhard Berger waited patiently to get a run as work continued on his engine. While Jean Lazy showed just what an exciting and brave driver he is. By for Schumacher, a sensational seventh for his first Grand Prix. Brabham's Mark Blundell is 13th with his teammate Martin Brundle, 60. Johnny Herbert is 21st for his return to Grand Prix Racing and Eric Comas starts last and 26th.
The Belgian Grand Prix is go! Senna leads, Prost second, Mansell third, Berger fourth. And good heavens, they all seem to be round La Source, unlike last year. Now, down to Eau Rouge and the climb up to Les Combes. And this is where Senna, as ever, will be trying to build a cushion, going as hard as he possibly can at the beginning. And I think that was Michael Schumacher dropping back. It was Schumacher dropping back. That was his first ever Grand Prix start. And Mansell is jockeying with Alain Prost. And Michael Schumacher's Grand Prix has ended on the first lap. The German is out. Bitter disappointment for him after the tremendous achievements of practice. Down to La Source. So the McLaren, Ferrari, Williams, Benetton. Berger is in fifth place. Jean Lacy is sixth. Stefano Modena is in seventh position. Andre de Cesaris is eighth. Roberto Moreno is ninth. Capelli is tenth. Martin Brundle is in eleventh place. And Pierre Luigi Martini is twelfth. And there's a challenge. Nigel Mansell is challenging Alain Prost for second place as they climb up towards Le Combe on lap two. Is the Englishman going to be into Le Combe? Second he is. He is. Mansell is up into second place. Both Ricardo Petr and Gutelman out. Well, two retirements. Lap one, Michael Schumacher. Lap two, Maurizio Gutelman in the Leighton house with its Ilmore engine. Williams is quick on the straights. He went past Prost pretty easily on the main straight, the obvious passing place after Eau Rouge. Looks like going down to Eau Rouge now and then up the hill. It's the fastest, longest straight. Of the and Ferrari stopped and that's Prost out. Prost, and that looked like a blow up with him. I saw a bit of flame coming out of the back of the car. And uh, that certainly looks terminal. And despite all their know-how, their money, their facilities, their experience and their expertise, Ferrari still can't match Williams and McLaren. They've had a very, very poor season by their standards with no victory yet. One time earlier on, getting past Andrea de Cesaris. Senna's not really making ground on Alessi at this point. PK is still fourth, Patrese is still fifth, the Cesar is sixth, the Modena is in seventh place, Berger is eighth, Moreno is ninth, Martini is tenth, Johnny Herbert in the Lotus Judd V8 is in eleventh position, and his teammate Nika Hakkinen is in twelfth place ahead of Martin Brundle, thirteenth, and Alessi is being... Alessi going through and taking Nigel Mansell, the, the three of them are together. Nigel Mansell loses the lead and Senna's closing right up on him. That's a lacy going through at the bus stop. And clearly Mansell's got some major problem or has had a problem. And Senna's passed him as well and he's slowed right down. He's fumbling around in the cockpit. And what a shame. And John Alacy now is driving as hard as he can in the lead on lap 23 to stave off Ayrton Senna with Kike back in the third position. Fourth now is Ricardo Patrese. Fifth is Andre de Cesaris. Nigel Mansell bitterly disappointed out of the car. Same way that Nigel down that is Hakkinen and behind Pique is Patrese. So second, third and fourth, Senna, Pique and Patrese are very, very close to each other now. And we'll see when John Lacy comes through, whether he has extended his lead over the McLaren Honda. Of the, that's the car you're looking at now. So there's Senna. The next one you see in shot will be Pique. And this is Pique. We're looking at Ayrton Senna ahead, who is in second place. Yes, but obviously had a major problem. He dropped right back. And... Uh, and yet he seems to be going all right at the moment. So the two obvious things, we didn't see what happened, is he could have had a quick spin, because he's lost some 10 seconds to uh, a lazy. Uh, alternatively, he may have had a gearbox problem and fumbled around a long time to try and get a gear. So Jonathan Palmer has news in the pits with Nigel Mansell. Nigel, that was bitterly disappointing. You looked to have the race very much in control. What happened? Uh, basically, we had a uh, we had an electrical uh, failure of some kind. 
I reset the uh, computer several times, but uh, it cleared momentarily, and then the fault came back, and in the end, it cut the engine and the gearbox. I reset everything again, probably four or five times, but at this time, the car was dead, and uh, I'm afraid the race was run. We're back again with Nelson Piquet, and Alesi now leads Senna by over 11. Senna has pulled away a little from Nelson Piquet, who has got in his mirrors this car, white six. Ricardo Patrese, fourth place up from 17th, and you can see that Senna is clearing off. He's got a clear track in front of him, whereas Nelson Piquet is having to fight to keep Patrese back. The Williams with Mansell was a lot quicker than me, but uh, he couldn't overtake me after my pit stop. Was I had a problem with one of the tyres, and I lost a lot of time in the pit stop, and everything was going going bad for me from there on. And uh, then Manso dropped out, I had a lazy to deal and I, I knew he didn't change tyres so I, I decided to wait for late stage in the race when he would have his tyres worn out. But uh, I was just near to him, just waiting for a later stage. Suddenly, out of the hairpin, I think from third to fourth I got second, or from fourth to fifth I got second gear. Completely, the, the gear selection went completely crazy. Similar thing as Brazil early in the year. And I said, okay, now forget it. I was stuck in a very short gear. I went all the way down, all up the hill in that stuck gear. And suddenly I managed to get a six gear suddenly. So then I went again, and I, that's when PK got near to me in one lap. And I, I had fifth, fourth, and third. And I tried once, I got second, but it was very funny. And I was worried to get stuck again. So from there on, I was only from third up. And it uh, was only a, a real problem at the helping. Everywhere else was okay. But at the helping, it was very difficult to stop the car and to accelerate out of there. So Ayrton Senna wins his fifth Belgian Grand Prix with just five gears, beating his teammate Gerhard Berger by 1.9 seconds. Nelson Piquet third in the Benetton, and his teammate Roberto Moreno makes it three Brazilians in the top four. Ricardo Patrese fifth, and Mark Blundell scores his first World Championship point with sixth place and the first point this season for Brabham and Yamaha. Ayrton Senna now leads Nigel Mansell in the World Championship by 22 points, with Patrese third ahead of Berger and Nelson Piquet moving up to fifth place ahead of Alain Prost. McLaren, 16 points ahead of Williams now in the Constructors' Championship, well ahead of Ferrari, Benetton, Jordan and Tyrrell. And it's the Italian Grand Prix at Monza in two weeks' time. All is not lost for Nigel Mansell, but he's got to do well there with just five races left.